I love David. That would be fun. So I was not paying attention for a second. I was reading my Twitter notifications. <sighs> um, the I was also disappointed by the Mint news. Yeah. Um, super that I predicted exactly the opposite. Um, I'm surprised by it. I, I... I'm really surprised by it. It does not seem to be the right move. I don't know. Who knows um, what the right move really is. But where is. No I apparently had a Dan Brown book on my bookshelf. And. Hello, David Priest. Hi, David. Hello. I know you're look how here. Look how sharp Ben is. And in fo- and it's high oh, definition, Ben. Yeah. Sharp Ben is? Isn't Ben always sharp? Oh. Not <laughs> my image. Uh, <laughs> but look, right. I know you're only here, David, uh, to uh, for lawfare uh, 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 user experience. Oh no, I'm, I'm here for the company. It's it's um, research we, and it's personal. But we thought we'd bring you in for the pre-game show. So say hello to the audience. Hello, audience. Hello, audience. <laughs> That's this not is... awkward at all. Yeah, that's not odd, awkward at all. This is Where's David. Dan Brown on your shelf? Oh, I'm not well, seeing Dan Brown, Dan Brown. Dan Brown was over here and was repla- I replaced him with Tom Kilancy because John, my partner, yeah. was like, I'm very embarrassed for you that you have this. I'm like, it was, it's my parents' bookshelf that I like have maneuvered into this thing and replaced <laughs> with some of my books. Wow. Like, my mom. You're throwing your parents under Dan the Brown. bus for this. I know. Classy. I, and it's like a theme on In Lua Fun is they don't watch the show, so I can just blame everything on them, like the I rest have, of my life. <laughs> I do not I do not have my setup with my bookshelves behind me, but if I did, you would prominently see this. Oh wow. Yeah. We have to have yeah. we have to have now that we, we gotta give the um uh the authors a few more days for people to have bought and read the book so that right. people will have actually have questions about it and it'll be different from the yeah. various podcasts i just that bought done. it and i bought another copy for my mom because her birthday's coming up and she's just like oh. like and she's just reading all of the the trump books that have come out she just got through um oh my god what's the one that you got the advance of ben which one yeah you get advances i, of get, all the, of I, get, I get to all of them in advance yeah. Um, Anyways, ex- except Woodward. This one is quite different than the others. It's not a yes. tell-all. It's yeah. not relating yeah. what happened. It's it's systematic. It's analytic, but it's readable, which makes it really, really different right now. I was telling Ben that I was reading um, in Hoppe's Shadow. Yeah. And I started it, and it was like a, I started it like a, to go to sleep type of thing i was like oh i'll just i'll start jack's book and no, i was no, up till four riveting. in the morning <laughs> I was yeah, like, it's completely yeah. i gotta tell you that that book struck me because i i read a lot but i don't like true crime type things i was never into mafia and crime books and i tend not to read personal narratives often i'm much more of a history or novels but not just the oh let me tell you about my dad kind of story and yet i had the same experience you do i could not put it down it's just so it was, compelling of a story and so well written it's so well written it's so well written and like also like if you know jack even a little bit like it's just like a fast it's fascinating and kind yeah. of just like insight and just feels like you're getting to know him better um so now right. i'm looking forward to the trump book that he to after trump entirely so. entirely different but enjoyable entirely in a, different in but way. cool david cool, cool. we've got to uh start the show so we're gonna uh uh, uh, kick you uh, out, kick, put you back in the audience. But it's great to see you. We're kicking face. you out. You can come back later. Yeah, come back. Uh, uh, come back I, up later, later this week. And I do have a. Uh, I know it's been a long time, but I do have <gasps> some oh, David, information you on your on question. Yes, oh, an intelligence the question. So report. Yeah, yeah. I do. So it's it's brief and it's not complete, but it's something. So it's kind so of like a the, PDB you, for Trump. It's you very be short, the guest tomorrow? And very incomplete. Do you want to be yeah. the guest tomorrow? Uh, what's tomorrow? Wednesday, the twenty third. Days, that, you know. Yeah, I would make a circle of time joke, but I don't want Ben to. Uh, it's a flat. Go off it's on a that. flat circle. It's a flat it's a circle. Flat circle. Um, Wednesday. I think I'm good. All okay. right. All right. That's bye for now.
Kick Perfect. me out. Um, Sarah is saying she is having trouble getting in. Um, so we're going to work on that. Um, hmm. Uh, she says, send the link again. You want to know what else is weird? It's been like a long time since I've had like a cold because I've been, <laughs> because well, of... you don't see anybody. You're, I know. No, like you're not in contact with people. I know. It's kind of funny. Your idea of social interaction is in lieu of fun. Um, yeah, I just kind of was like, okay, I guess like I don't get sick anymore. Everything has to be allergies because I haven't talked to anyone and gotten a cold, like that could get me sick. Um, yeah, maybe people with toddlers, I'm just like talking to myself. Maybe people with toddlers are going to just start wearing masks in their own home. What if we mask toddlers so that you can... All right, well, let's right. start, and Sarah will get in as... Oh, that may be Sarah. No, that's somebody named Claire. Genevieve, no, I wasn't talking about the Bolton book. I think I was talking about the Flynn book. That's what I was thinking of. Um, but Let's start, and Sarah will show up when she is able to get in. Um, all right. I will keep um, an eye out. You keep an eye out. I'll start us... Life Republican voters against Trump is there. Oh, is really? The that's probably Sarah. Do you think or, that's her? Uh, I have this. Uh, let's see if that's Sarah. I mean, she does run the organization Republican voters against Trump. I've um, heard that. Yeah, so I've heard that too. <laughs> All right, um, I'm gonna start us. We will uh, um, we will obtain Sarah momentarily. That sounds very transactional. Um, um, I'm very excited to see how this goes and how the the scary blue button. The blue button is uh, still not lit, which proves that not all of this is a function of the functioning of my computer. It's also... Uh, oh, uh, Sarah's here. See? All is well. And we're live. It is Tuesday, September 22nd, 2020. And it is an important day in the history of In Lieu of Fun. It is six months to the day, 180 days um, since fun stopped and we had to start making plans in lieu of fun. Uh, that was six months ago to the day, 180 episodes of In Lieu of Fun. Since then, there has not been a single day when anyone has had any fun. Uh, there have been 180 days where we need, you know, fun supplements, uh, <laughs> kind of like vitamins, dietary supplements. And uh, we have been there for you. And today we have two really important announcements. Uh, in that time, by the way, 200,000 Americans have died. I don't want to make a joke about that, so I'm not going to. I just want to say, in lieu of fun, we have death. Uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg was with us at the beginning of in lieu of fun, not with us at the end. John Lewis was with us at the beginning before in lieu of fun, when there was we were still allowed to have fun. John Lewis and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Now we're not allowed to have fun, John Lewis or Ruth Bader Ginsburg or 200,000 other people. But we have really important good news announcements uh, on the 180th day of In Lieu of Fun. We have, for example, High Definition Wittis, which as of today, my, um, my audio visual upgrades um, are complete. 
my snazzy new very fast computer arrived and you will see I am not glitching anymore. The upgrades that began with my awesome internet speed have now been completed with my CPU speed and memory. I'm not gonna be disappearing anymore. You're not gonna hear echoing because my AirPods can't keep up with, or the computer can't keep up with my AirPod connection. So we've got uh, uh, high definition WITIS for in lieu of fun. And that's important because, you know, that way you get the bad news faster. Um, and Kate also has a very important announcement on the 180th day of in lieu of fun. Yeah. Uh, my announcement is I got my in lieu of fun merch uh today in lieu of fun there is a murder hornet with baby prosecco i just want to also also point out 180 days ago there were no more murder, murder hornets known in the united states this That's is true. a creature of this beard there weren't wildfires there were no derechos in iowa like superman but we didn't have in lieu of fun merch either. So it's a balance, you know, 200,000 Americans it's pretty, I'm, or like, in lieu of fun is, merch. You get your choice. Yes. Uh, you the good yeah. and the bad. This is what you get in Trump's America. T-shirts <laughs> with uh, with um, baby cannons, baby chipmunks, murder hornets, baby Prosecco, um, and no fun. Yeah. So, so that's this is the trade-offs that we live with these days. You know, you can have your fun, you can have live Americans, uh, great Americans can be living if elderly and frail, or you can have the merch and high definition with us. I would say it's up to you, except the truth is it's not. We're not allowed to have fun anymore, but one thing we get in lieu of fun in the new America is to have a five o'clock drink every now and then with Sarah Longwell Sarah Longwell, welcome to the show. Thanks. Hi, for Sarah. Me. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Did you bring any funny news that I didn't get to hear yet today? I, per I stayed away from my computer today just in case. <laughs> like, I want to know. I'm like, has any other have any other high profile Republicans been arrested for anything? Yeah, because the, right, the last time you were here, Steve Bannon had just been arrested and Kate didn't know about it, right? Yeah. And you got. And you, yeah, and you were wearing your like polo shirt or something, like your oh yeah, your like little zippy hoodie thing. That was sick. I was, I was double pop collared because in in homage, in homage yeah. to Steve Bannon. Yeah, uh, pour one out. Oh, break really quickly before we get started. I want to say thank you to Michael Fromberger and John Bordeaux uh, for putting together. Uh, both John commissioned the logo from an artist um, friend of his, Kevin Thorne, and uh, it's pretty amazing. And he and uh, he and Michael worked together to kind of put up the store and everything else. So thank you guys so much for doing that. It's really great. And of course, all proceeds from the Mert store will go to the World Central Kitchen. Kate and I will take none of it except the stuff we skim off the top after telling you we're going to use it to build the wall. Uh, the merch <laughs> store link is in the Q and A. Is in the is in the uh, the comments. All right. So Sarah, let's start with the important question here. There is a debate going on in the Never Trump community, and for those of uh, for those members of the audience who don't who haven't followed this debate, it's actually pretty interesting. There are the pessimists like Sarah Longwell who say the Ruth Bader Ginsburg thing is really going to shake up the race or could stand to shake up the race in Trump's favor. There are the uh, the stable, nothing can change anything. It's all baked in people. And then there is Rick Wilson, who went from one to the other and now thinks this is going to energize uh, Biden and liberal voters. And so my question is, um, first of all, are you reevaluating your initial pessimism uh, in light of the first few days events uh, following uh, the advent of the, uh, the, the, 
the the events of the last few days, both on the on the Ruth Bader Ginsburg death, but also the decision by the majority and by the president to push aggressively? Or do you still think this is a uh, just what the doctor ordered for the president? Um. I, how do you even know what I think? What are, what are, are you listening because to? Because you were on the podcast oh, with Charlie yeah, Sykes right. on Saturday morning, <laughs> and you were rounding up the... I listened to you, Sarah. Sarah. Like, you I, have I, listening like... devices. Like... Well, <laughs> well, you know, I do a secret podcast with JBL where we've delved oh, into this. Um, I, I, I know about the secret podcast, but there I was talking about podcasts? the... Pi- I go off the public yeah. record right? because these are things the audience can share. The, right. po- the secret podcast, by the way, is available to people who support the bulwark, which you should all do because then you get access to the secret podcast. Yes. What a good idea. And if you listen to the secret podcast, I love uh, secret. You you would you would know that that I I have I was I have I was reevaluating, you know, when I did the emergency podcast on Saturday, um Saturday morning at like 8 30, I was still sort of just reeling from the news. And I think my initial reaction and the reason that I was feeling um, sort of pessimistic about how it would would change the macro political environment is that if you're Donald Trump and you have been down in every single national poll for the last eight months and you've just had relentless bad news, anything that A, changes the conversation away from COVID and your disastrous handling of COVID is a net benefit. Two, you know, the conservatives, it's a, we have a culture of the co- courts among conservatives. And it and it, it Ann Applebaum had a really good piece about this over the weekend where she talks about when, I saw that. when it gets when it starts to be about the courts, it tends to sort of send people into their ideological corners. Right. And they dig in in this way. And I also remembered the Kavanaugh fights, you know, because the, the courts end up sort of they split the never Trump community between the people who, you know, maybe are are slightly more siding with Democrats versus people who are like, if I'm going to get anything out of Donald Trump, I want these Supreme Court justices, you know, so give them to me like a Matt Lewis or somebody like that. Um, And so I just if you're and and part of the way that I always evaluate whether news is good or bad is that I think about it from Trump's perspective. Does Trump think this news is good or bad for him? Is he happy or sad that this happened? And I don't think you can say anything other than Republicans and Trump are very happy to have this fight right now to both chew up the airwaves in terms of what they're, what people are going to be talking about, an opportunity to energize their base in a way that it had not been general. I mean, when you've got right track, wrong track numbers among your own people saying that, you know, a majority of them think the country's going in the wrong direction or that things aren't good, something like this helps you. So this, that was my, that was my initial assessment. But. Yeah. Well, and I don't know that I've changed that quite that piece of the assessment. I think I was maybe overly bleak, uh, though, in how it would actually impact the election, because here's the part of what's happened in the last few days. Okay, so the question that I had was, so what's going to what's Trump going to do with this seat? Does he does he dangle it to try to energize people and say, you have to reelect me? Um, Do they if they jam it through, does that help him? Uh, because I would argue that part of what's changed is I saw it if he I thought that he and Mitch McConnell would not be quite aligned, that Mitch McConnell would be jam this through. And Trump would be like, I don't know. I think this kind of helps me if I say reelect me or you don't get this. And instead, what they decided to do, it's now clear, is like they're going to go for it. Right. The whole thing is. And maybe part of the calculation there is Donald Trump would like a very favorable Supreme Court for himself when this if this election is very tight and it ends up in a 2000 where things are end up the supreme court ends up playing a decisive role um but anyway so they're going to jam it through now now when you do something like that and all of the polling that i've seen subsequently like from reuters says that 63 percent of the public think that they should wait and obviously all of these republicans on the are on the record from not that long ago saying this is something that you shouldn't do in an election year so it's starting to look more like the public opinion environment sort of against them but the constitutional environment favors them so they're going to jam it through and say, and and honestly, like their posture is just like a party that has lost everything, right? This is like their Hail Mary, we're about to lose the Senate, we're about to lose the election. And so like, this is the last thing we've got. Uh, so like, let's knock it out. And if people are mad at us for it, oh, well, and we lose the election, it was going that direction anyway. That's the posture I see. So I'm slightly, 
now I'm slightly, I'm, I'm now I'm more bullish on the idea that they will get it through and done. Before I was also like, that clock is ticking. Like that is a serious time crunch. There's only like 13 working days that the Senate has scheduled between now and election day. Um, but they're obviously, they're gonna make everybody come back, pull them off the trail. They're gonna jam this through. And I don't think that that creates a better environment for them electorally is where I've landed. I've met it out. It's very federalist society. Like this, fo like I think that that's kind of that's kind of how I like I read it a little bit is that there's just this focus, this long term focus of like, well, if we're going to lose the executive, then at least we can keep winning in the courts, which is has been, I think, uh, really kind of the tactic of the Federalist Society for quite some time. Um, and uh, I don't know, that's just kind of that was like the way that you were, you were describing it right now kind of reinforced that to me. Um, I don't know if that like that resonates with you at all, but. Yeah, I, I think that's, uh, I think, I mean, that's sort of what I'm saying is I think that yeah. they think that the courts are kind of the last bastion of the things that they're own. And they're, Mitch McConnell basically seems ready to light the Senate chances potentially on fire in order to get this through. But I think, now, that, why, I guess why, also why do you think that is a rational act on his part? Objectively, the difference between a five to four majority on the six on the Supreme Court and a six to three majority on the six, Supreme Court is less than the difference between controlling the Senate and not controlling the Senate. Um, after all, controlling the Senate is controlling half of a branch of government and the more powerful half at that, whereas controlling, you know, having firmer control over the Supreme Court is, I, I, I wouldn't say it's one ninth of a branch of government because this is a key vote, but it's not a third of a branch of government. It's not, you know, maybe it's a quarter. Um, why do you think it's a rational act on McConnell's part to bet the Senate on a Supreme Court seat? Well, I mean, because the, the bet... I mean, it depends on how much he loses the Senate by, right? So, and like, whether he would have lost it anyway, and whether he would which have is, lost of course, it unknowable. It, that's right. And, and but see, that's my point is I think that they already think that Collins is gone. They already think McSally's gone. They already think Gardner's gone. And so now they're thinking. So they're looking at like a place like Iowa, okay, where Ernst is a little bit in trouble. Does this help or hurt Joni Ernst? Probably helps her in Iowa. Uh, and so like the thing, cause that's the, that's the difference. Like, does it hurt or help Lindsey Graham who's suddenly running neck and neck with Jamie Harrison? Probably. I think it hurt. I gotta say, I think it hurts Lindsey Graham. Why? Tell me. Because. Yeah. Tell me. Be I, I because with Sarah. think of all the ads that Jamie Harrison is going to run that says, you know, here's Lindsey Graham in 2016. Here's Lindsey Graham in 2018. Here's Lindsey Graham today you know, how can you trust him? Yeah, um, here's my counterpoint. Here's my counterpoint. Donald Trump is running, it's like plus eight or something in South Carolina, which is not as good as he did in 2016, but it's still pretty strong for him. And I think that the reason that Lindsey Graham doesn't do as well is because he, people don't perceive him as being Trumpy enough. They, can't, they think he's let the Russian hoaxers run wild. And so people want to see the Lindsey Graham of the Kavanaugh hearings that's, you know, lecture yelling at people and saying, I won't let you get me Dems. And that's why he was on TV most recently, because he was on Fox News and he's like, Jamie Harrison's outspending me, contribute to my campaign. I won't be ruled by this mob. I won't be pushed around. Mitch McConnell won't be pushed around. Like, that's his play. That's what he thinks is going to help him. But Yeah, I but agree I, with Sarah 100 percent. But I guess my question is. Jamie Harrison is out raising him in that context. And so I guess my question is, who is it energizing? When the world looks at Lindsey Graham right now, a lot of people are saying, ugh, and giving money to Jamie Harrison. I, it just doesn't, it's just not clear to me that he is creating more. Now, I am deeply not in touch with the average South Carolina voter, white or black, by the way. Um, you know, this is just not a, you know, not my mid-Atlantic uh, 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 urban socioeconomically advantaged cultural whatever milieu. 
That said, I I don't see like who has Lindsey Graham endeared himself to other than a certain group of, you know, kind of MAGA Uberales kind of people. Yeah, but that's who's going to vote in South Carolina. I mean, that's that's where the margins are in South Carolina. And like, look, here's another example just to, you know, Mitch McConnell. Amy McGrath is raising ungodly sums of money, just ungodly. And everyone hates Mitch McConnell. His approval ratings are at like 36 percent in Kentucky. He's going to win in Kentucky. People can stop sending money to Amy McGrath. It's nothing against her. She's not going to win that seat. And people should like let it go. And they should spend money on Senate races that are winnable uh, because she's just she's not going to pull it out. It's like so if, what, if you were advising people, say, 96 people who were live on uh, Crowdcast and 120 or so who were live on YouTube and all the other people who are going to watch this uh, not live, uh, what is the right, you know, for your marginal dollar, you don't want to give to Kelly, who's pretty clearly going to win in Arizona, or to uh, Sarah Gideon, looks like she's going to win in Maine. Where is your marginal dollar best spent yeah, so, in Senate races right now? I mean, look, I think that I think that Lindsey Graham, that race is close enough. And Lindsey Graham is sort of vulnerable. I mean, when I see him on TV, he looks panicked to me. And I think that that's a perfectly good race to invest in. I would look at MJ Hager in Texas, who's only running five behind Cornyn in a race where Joe Biden's running even with Trump in Texas, which is one of the craziest things anybody's ever seen. Uh, and so I think that that, that like, I, I don't, don't remember what the last polling is for McGrath, but she's down, I think, by double digits. Like, it's not, it's not close. Whereas Emily Hager's got a five point deficit and she's basically unknown. Um, and so that is a better, like, if I was just all anything aside, just looking at things analytically there. And then the other thing is in Georgia. So Georgia's got two Senate races. Um, and you know, and they've got this Dem that's like hanging out that might cause real problems for the 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 Dem who's doing much better. I forget his name. Um, oh, and then the other race that's interesting, where right, that's not getting much attention at all, that's very interesting for the Supreme Court fight is Alaska, uh, where Sullivan uh, is is looking like maybe in a dead heat, and he's just had his senior the senior senator, the senior Republican senator, just came out and said they didn't want to vote on this. And so that creates an interesting dynamic in Alaska that's not a very socially conservative state. And like, this is one of the things too about just analyzing the current environment as it relates to the Supreme Court. We don't know who the nominee is yet, right? Because if it is uh, Amy Coney Barrett, who's the front rather runner right now, so lots of conservatives really like her. She's sort of a star in FedSoc world. She's a very socially conservative. Uh, you know, Alaska is not a very socially conservative state at all. Like that may play really well in Iowa and Midwestern states may not play as well in places like Arizona, uh, in places like Florida, in places like uh, Alaska. So like anyway, but your question about marginal dollar, those are some of the races I might take a look at. Um, what about Mississippi? Yeah, uh, I that one like just popped uh, recently. It's just like, I mean, Mike Espy, um has not been a lot of, on a lot of people's radar screens, but he's polling awfully well. Uh, yeah, I mean, and that's the thing, right? Like at this point, I don't, I, I don't know off the top of my head where every where the fundraising is for every single one of these Senate candidates. But my guess is is that like Amy Graff, just Amy Graff just like has enough money. Just like don't send her anymore and send it to Espy. Send it to somebody who could who could do something with it. Send it to MJ Hager. Who uh, who could do something with it? Uh, th that's just like analytically, that seems to make more sense. But like people get these these people in their heads that they're like, that's my I gotta beat Mitch McConnell, or I'm excited about this person, and it 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 doesn't necessarily. They're just like not gonna win. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, I really, I mean, I'm still kind of, I'm still kind of wondering if they can make it happen in 13, 13 14 days. I really like I just um I'm I'm a little un, I'm a little uncertain. Do you think that they're going to be able to pull this off, Sarah? Is that like kind of like I mean does that I mean I know that they're going to try. We I mean but I'm I'm kind of curious if like you think it's Yeah, so I'll say one other thing about the dynamics. So I think can they do it? Uh maybe, but they have no room for error. There's zero margin for error. So like anything, but this is where 
this is where this brinksmanship to me gets interesting for the political dynamic. So one of the things that has got to be in Mitch McConnell's head is that, and it's already out there, you can see it, is that when you push Dems, right? So they start to, they're really upset about this. So then they start talking about things like court packing, eliminating the filibuster. And I don't know on a real voter, you know, thing, whether or not like people are really wrapped up in court packing and, and the filibuster. That being said, I'm sure Fox News is talking about nothing. He, despite the fact that Joe Biden has absolutely said he doesn't want to pack the courts, absolutely said he wants to maintain the filibuster, they're going to talk about Dems doing those things. And so Mitch McConnell is also thinking, like, can you change the political environment with this fight if Dems try to gum up the works in some way? So I've seen something floated, you know, for example, where it's like, well, we could impeach Bill Barr or we could impeach, you know, Trump. And that would take precedent schedule wise. They would, ha they would have to ha hold those hearings prior to a SCOTUS hearing. OK, so let's say you do that. It's sort of like the gambit, though, of Republicans jamming this through is do you then look like you're using constitutional gimmicks uh, to hold things up? And does it make people angrier at the Democrats? Does it reinforce this notion that the Democrats are radical and that while Joe Biden is doing really well right now with independents and college educated suburban voters, you know, does do people start to be like, I don't know, the Dems? Uh, they seem really crazy. Like, that's sort of what I think he's the optics he's kind of hoping for. But doesn't that depend on whether you do it during the lame duck um, or or before the election? I mean, if you do it before the election, you set up exactly that argument.